Okay, welcome everyone. Today I'm going to present a very very important topic in all of classical mechanics, which is the classical mechanics of non-conservative systems. So, uh, let me first explain what the problem is. The problem is that in roughly in all of physics, we see uh, we try to divide problems into two categories. One is initial valid problem, and one is boundary valid problem. So the first thing uh, we sort of learn in classical mechanics is the Hamilton's principle of stationary action. Uh, and this is sort of a very, very successful principle in explaining uh, from a very, very uh, easy and idealized system to very complex systems such as quantum field theories and etc. And uh, what we get uh, consequently is that we see the Lagrangian mechanics and Hamiltonian mechanics uh, they are very, very successful in describing a lot of processes. However, um, there is a little bit, uh, not a little bit, there, there is a very big hole in this, uh, this sort of, I'd, I'd like to say gimmick, but uh, in, in the popularity of Lagrangian and Hamiltonian mechanics, especially uh, all of the things that's based on Hamilton's principle of stationary action, and that is, it is not suitable for explaining generic non-conservative systems. And when I say non-conservative systems, uh, we can um, indicate in various ways, but uh, just to name a few different, uh, in a different style, uh, we see that velocity-dependent systems are non-conservative, and they uh, sometimes we have systems that are history dependent uh, and non local kind of systems, non linear kind of systems. Uh, that's not really the important thing. The important thing is that non conservative systems or dissipative systems uh, are very hard to deal with. And we only know one of the instances where we have sort of a little bit uh, understanding with uh, in explaining. Uh, uh, velocity-dependent forces uh, by using Hamilton's principle of stationary action, and that is uh, when we some, use something called Rayleigh's dissipation function. I hope everyone who has studied classical mechanics at the very introductory level is familiar to that. So that's sort of the only cases, at least I know, uh, which we can use uh, in order to uh, analyze velocity-dependent forces. So. Uh, why is this apparent discrepancy? Why we cannot do it? And this thing uh, very, uh, very uh, suspiciously, uh, if we look at the Hamilton's uh, principle, that's a boundary value principle in time. What I mean is that we try to minimize something which is called an action, and uh, we have an action here. Actually, I've written a curly L. It shouldn't be a curly L, it's just an L, Lagrangian, I apologize for that. So action is uh, this quantity which is the time integration of the Lagrangian. And uh, we apply the boundary conditions that uh, at, at, at the starting point and at the end point, uh, we do not vary the trajectory. Meanwhile, in between, we can vary that by a little bit using uh, some sort of parameters and we see uh, which part actually minimizes or, or maximizes, or in a word, extremizes the action. And consequently, we derive euler lagrange equation, which gives us the equation of motions. And then we use initial values uh, to solve uh, the problem uh, completely. And uh, this is a very, very uh, inno innocuous observation. But it has very profound consequences because it, it looks like there is a little bit of discrepancy. We're using a boundary value principle, but we are using initial values to solve the equation of motion. So uh, probably if we can do some here uh, something, uh, probably we can uh, reassert the whole principle in terms of uh, initial values only. And that might help us to uh, extend the Hamilton's principle to non-conservative systems as well. So, uh, in this whole presentation, I will not go 
in very general details, I would just simply focus on a very uh, sort of fundamental problem uh, that we have known all along, is the problem of simple harmonic oscillator. And we'll try to uh, sort of amend this apparent discrepancy uh, on, on this perspective, on the perspective of this problem. So what, the, what is the problem? We have this setup where we have two harmonic oscillators. One is one has mass little m and frequency omega, and that oscillator is coupled to another mass, which which is also part of an oscillator, uh, which has mass big m and frequency uh, capital omega, and they are coupled together. And there's a coupling strength which is lambda. And so if we write down the action, that's simply the action. We have uh, the action of the uh, small, uh, the one of the harmonic oscillators, small m, the other capital M, and then in between we have this uh, coupling term. And obviously this Q and capital Q uh, denotes the amplitudes. And so if you look at the system, it's as a total system is conservative. But uh, these two masses, they can exchange energy with each other. And so Q, uh, although the whole system is conservative, at least locally, Q seems to be non-conservative. So what can I do? Our main focus is on this system, uh, which has this small mass, uh, uh, which has this mass small m and frequency omega. And what we do is that we find out uh, the equation of motion for uh, this capital M. Uh, actually, I should rather say capital Q. And what to do, we, we uh, homogenize the equation of motion and we solve it. And then we plug the solution back into this action. And so uh, this process is called integrating Q out. So uh, consequently, what we have is that we have an effective action where now, instead of general Q, we uh, replace it uh, by using the homogeneous solution uh, for the capital Q. So that's an effective action. And uh, now we have rewritten this action. Notice that uh, the first part of the action uh, remains almost the same. Uh, in the middle term, the coupling with uh, small Q and the capital Q We've used the capital Q, which is the homogeneous solution. And then uh, here we have used the Green's function, retarded Green's function, uh, which, is ac which actually comes from the equation of motion of capital Q. So this helps us to write down uh, the action, uh, the effective action. And this has a name. It's called a Fokker action. Uh, that's just a bit of details. And so we notice something very interesting, that is when we write down this action, this last term, uh, this one here, is, um, is symmetric. It's symmetric uh, under um, T and T prime. So if we exchange T and T prime, uh, we don't see actually much of it is changing, uh, particularly this combination here, Q time, QT times qt prime. So this combination doesn't change. So that means it only couples to the uh, the symmetric part of the retarded Green's function. Right? So we'll assume that Green's function has this uh, symmetric part and other part, which is probably anti-symmetric part. But uh, since q times q uh, is symmetric under t to t prime, so only the symmetric part of the retarded Green's functions will be coupled. So uh, now we can use this identity, which is uh, the retarded Green's function becomes the advanced Green function when we change the sign of the argument, right? So here we have t minus t prime. Here we have t prime minus t. So then uh, we can do something very interesting. We instead of just simply writing the retarded Green's function, we use uh, we use both the retarded Green's function and the advanced Green function. And we notice that uh, now we have another 
uh, re refined or rewritten action, which is the effective action we have. And this last term is very important. And this here we can insert this part of advanced green function uh, because of this apparent symmetry between q uh, of t and q of t prime. So from here, it's very easy to find out the equation of motion uh, for a q of t, just simply using the normal variational principle that we use uh, or have been using all along. So that's pretty fascinating. But here is the thing, whenever we are using uh, this uh, advanced Green function, we know that it breaks, it sort of breaks the causality of the problem. But in physics, uh, causality is one of the fundamental tenets of uh, all, the, all, all the physics that we know. And although the advanced Green function has its uh, application uh, in a lot of places, but th for this particular problem, uh, this uh, contribution from advanced Green's function actually uh, allow us to question the causality of the result. So uh, the presence of this Green's function, it means uh, not only it's not causal, but, uh, but it, it cannot also be specified using only initial data alone, right? And uh, this, this kernel of this integral is symmetric in time, which means the integral is uh, actually a conservative interaction between Q and capital Q, right? Uh, there is a certain kind of... Uh, we have seen that uh, the total system, when we consider it, is conservative. And uh, it, 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 it looks like there is this uh, intimate connection between the symmetry uh, in time and uh, the, conserva the conservation uh, property of this, this system. But however, uh, conservation, uh, sorry, dissipation or non-conservation is a time asymmetric process, right? Uh, we cannot just simply go uh, back and forth in time uh, in a symmetric manner when we have dissipation in the system. So what can we do, right? Uh, our first instinct should be we should break the symmetry. And so instead of just having one single function, q of t times q of t prime, uh, we replace it uh, by two functions, not just one. So we have doubled the number of coordinates, uh, which is here we have q1 of t uh, times q2 of t prime, which, which is uh, a general but also very, uh, the simplest uh, thing we can do. So now that we have broken the symmetry, uh, it it has uh, it comes along with its own perks. We now have an additional set of uh, variables. So what do we do? We simply vary it norm as we normally do, and then at the end, we after the variation, we equate these two sets of variables. So we have doubled the coordinates, we have parameterized the path as we do, and do we have enough condition for variation? Uh, as, as always, we see this latter part, this goes away. Uh, but for now, it goes away only for the initial condition. Remember, we are trying to solve the problem using initial conditions only. So uh, at, at, at the beginning, uh, after the variation, of course, these two parts are the same. Uh, at the end, they must be the same. So we have this set of uh, boundary, con uh, this set of conditions. As so our actual functional uh, becomes like this. So we have a contribution from Q, a contribution from Q2, and there is this function which is K that will describe the generalized force. Now I should mention, uh, we'll assume that it should not be derivable from a potential because it, it, if it is, we can just simply make it absorbed into the two Lagrangians and this will be just two separate Lagrangians as well. So notice what it does at the right side we have this uh, traditional uh, representation of Hamilton's principle but now what we're doing, we're using two different initial uh, set of coordinates and from which uh, we try to evolve the system. But uh, it's what 
the only thing that we know is these two initial conditions and we do not know the boundary condition. So that can vary as well. So what we do, we have, uh, so here is this thing, um, we, t we go from T1 to T, T initial to T final for coordinate uh, number one set of, yeah, coordinate. And for the second set of the coordinate, uh, we come back from the final to the initial point. So uh, the final coordinate should all, can always be varied, but the initial co set of coordinates, they, they stay uh, stationary. So uh, this order of time is also different for these two sets. And when we make the time order the same, we get negative sign, and that's how we write the new Lagrangian. So uh, it is uh, not necessary, but it's convenient to uh, to set a new set of coordinates, Q plus and Q minus. Uh, and when we, uh, at the end of the variation, go to the physical limit, of course, we uh, make sure Q1 is equal to Q2. And that makes this Q negative disappear and Q plus uh, coincide with Q. And so uh, for this two set of coordinates, we can also define two set of conjugate momenta. We can, call, we can also translate uh, the parameterization into the new language. Uh, we set the stationary action under variation like this. And uh, the, uh, we, have, we have these uh, using uh, the equality condition, which is Q1 equal to Q2. And uh, during the variation, this uh, eta, that additional a uh, variation that we have introduced, they go away, uh, and also the initial variation, uh, variation at the initial point also goes away. So all these conditions um, help us to find out the equation of motion like this. But here, notice we have two equations of motion. Notice the uh, plus minus here and minus plus here. All right, so um, in the physical limit, only one of the equations will survive. And this equation becomes this, right? And we also have only one conjugate momenta because the other one vanishes. And so this is uh, our equation of motion. Now, when this generalized force is zero, we should be able to rederive the euler lagrange equation. And as it turns out, we do. And if this uh, generalized force is not zero, then of course we uh, assign it as the non-conservative potential. So for our system, k is equal to zero. We have these four initial conditions, of course, because uh, the number of variables has uh, doubled. So uh, we integrate out the q plus minus. So they are, they are here. Uh, we solve them. We get the retarded Green's function, uh, as we do. And notice that we have two solutions now. Uh, here Q8 is, of course, the homogeneous solution. And then we uh, have this particular solution uh, on the right. But now we have two solutions, and we have sort of separated the uh, retarded contribution, retarded Green's function's contribution uh, from the advanced Green's function contribution. And of course, we'll obviously deal with Q plus in the physical limit uh, and uh, discard at least for our problem, uh, the latter solution. So uh, here is the explicit form, the familiar form of the solution for uh, simple harmonic motion, the homogeneous solution that we all know. So now uh, we have this effective action. We have rewritten all those things. In the last term, which is the most important thing, we see that Q plus and Q minus are no longer symmetric. So that's a huge achievement for us, and we have broken uh, that a causal part uh, that was occurring previously. Uh, we have, uh, now we can find out the equation of motion. Uh, by the way, this is the explicit form of the Green's function. And the way to see that how do we get a general formulation is simply to substitute a single capital Q, which, is, which was uh, the, the external part of the subsystem uh, that we are considering, uh, and we generalize that to many, many subsystems, and that will give us 
the uh, nice formalism to generalized external force. So thank you for listening. <laughs>